Bow. What's up, everybody? Once again, it's Brand Man Sean, and today I got a very special guest for you guys, Damian Ritter. Now, if you don't know him by name, Damian was one of the co-founders of Funk Volume, a label that was making millions in revenue, including artists like Hopson, Swizz, Jaron Benton, quite a few more. I'm not going to go through their whole roster, but we talk about really what it takes to build a record label. And there's a lot of great insights for people who want to be managers and on the business side. But if you want to build a record label, if you want to build a brand, this is the guy that's worth listening to. So there's going to be a lot of things he talks about. For now, let's just go ahead and hop into it. So, Damien, uh, tell everybody how you got into the music industry and what you were doing before that. Sure. So uh, prior to 2008, I had no experience in music industry whatsoever um, outside of just being a fan of music. Um, I went to UC Berkeley. I was a business major when I graduated in 2002. I was an internal auditor for Wells Fargo. Mm -hmm. Then I got a job with Goldman Sachs in London. So I was all financial services. Um, and then in 2005, I decided to go to business school, press the reset button, went to business school at Stanford, got my MBA. Um, you know, so still no music. And then when I graduated from Stanford, I took a job with Deloitte Consulting in Chicago. So I was a management consultant for okay. Deloitte Consulting in their strategy and operations group. So I worked with them for about a year and some change. And then that's when I got laid off. This was around 2008. So 2008, the economy was kind of going through a rough patch, uh, got caught in the first round of layoffs. I wasn't actually that mad about it because I wasn't that happy. Um, I realized that, you know, each job that I had, I just kept finding what I wasn't that passionate about. Um, so I was going back to the drawing board and my brother hit me up. He was at a, a college called UC Irvine here in Southern California. He's an artist. He, he said that he was kind of wanting to drop out and do music full time. So it just so happened that it coincided with me being laid off. I was like, okay, let me see how I can help him out. He had a friend at the time that was equally as frustrated, but in a, in a different position. He was signed to a, a label at the time. Things just weren't going that well. He had the idea for Funk Volume, which eventually became the label. Um, his name's Hobson. A lot of people have kind of seen or know part of the story uh, of, of the rise and crash and burn of Funk Volume. But the three of us got together. Uh, we, I said, you know, I'll be responsible for the business end. You guys be responsible for the creative. And I kind of just jumped in it and, and we figured it out. That's how I got into the music industry. Got it. So... I mean, obviously, there's no one way into the music industry. I'm sure you know a lot of different people at this point and who have came in completely different ways. Would you say it's pretty much safe to say there is no one way to get in the game? There definitely is no one way. I mean, everybody comes to the table with different resources, different relationships. Um, you know, I had some money saved, so I was able to uh, in invest some money into the label, but obviously I didn't have any relationships. Or anybody, no, nobody that I knew of off top. I mean, I eventually realized that my network was, you know, I, I, I had networked for quite some time. I was part of a fraternity. So there was different pieces. I had never looked for anybody in the music industry. So I didn't know who was part of my network. Um, so there was, but there was nobody that I could turn to and be like, help me grow this label or help me start this label. Um, but looking at it, looking at the industry, just knowing that the fans were the, cru the, the most crucial piece you know, if you have fans, you can tour. If you have fans, you can sell music. Fans, you can get sponsorship. So the more fans you have, the more opportunities open up for you. So that became our focus is just how do we get in front of people? How do we build momentum? How do we get more fans? Because I knew that all the opportunities will be unlocked once we had enough fans. I got you. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. So when, when you first got to the label, or you say, all right, this is you're in the mindset. I started this label. My brother, he's here. Obviously, you have family on the line and you don't have a job. So I'm sure it's kind of like back to the wall. Then you got hops in. What would they like artist wise? What kind of fan base did they already have at the moment you guys decided to start the label? Uh, my brother didn't really have much of a fan base. I mean, Hobson had a little bit of a fan base. You know, at that time, MySpace was still popping. So his MySpace was 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 fairly decent but nothing to 
um, build a career on just yet. You know, what year was this again? What's that? What year was this again? 2008. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah that's, yeah, that's yeah. hella early because yeah. he wasn't that big in like 2010. He, he wasn't really blown yet. Right. Yeah, so it took us it took us about two or three years for it to even be an actual business. So you know, for two and three years, we were just putting out content. Uh, we, re- we released a project called Haywire. That was like a joint album where half the half the songs were my brother, half the songs were Hobson, and then there was well, actually a third were my brother, a third were Hobson, and a third with them together. Uh, we released that for free. Uh, we started just doing anything and everything that could in- interact and engage with fans. So obviously it's releasing music and videos, but we also did like you sh- a Ustream show that we did weekly called Funk Volume TV. Uh, the guys were doing like local um, like contest performances where they would you know win money. Um, so we were just doing anything and everything that we could to get to get in front of fans heavy engagement on social media. You know, I, we made a, a very crucial decision early to really adopt Facebook and really take advantage of the Facebook community, even though the artists were a little reluctant at first because it didn't look as playful. It didn't look as colorful as MySpace. You couldn't really change your page up and make it look crazy. Um, but it, that was definitely one of our smartest decisions was, was jumping on Facebook early. Okay, so being early to a platform, be, being early to a platform is always like an advantage in itself. Mm-hmm. So, would you say that was one of the biggest things that helped move you guys, audience? Yeah, for sure. I mean, because back then Facebook didn't really have the restrictions on the reach that it does now. So it's a lot. It's a lot harder. I mean, I definitely think um, artists should be on Facebook still because there's a lot of people there, and we do a lot of paid paid social media marketing on, on Facebook. Um, but it definitely was easier to grow a fan base on Facebook back then um, than it is now, for sure. Got you. So you said in those three years before it was a legitimate business, a lot of people that are watching this or going to be watching this are in that space, right? Mm-hmm. And I know you said you were doing a lot of things. Can you Go a little bit deeper into details of the mentality you had and what y'all were trying to do system wise and like what the and what the artists were kind of tasked with doing, what you as the business person was tasked with doing, just to give them in depth idea. Sure. So I tried to give them the opportunity to just kind of focus on music and focus on video content and um, you know, put out a, having having dope visuals is crucial. Um, you know, it, it we're constantly competing for people's attention and there's so much video content out there now, mm-hmm. you know, Hobbs was very good. He was very good at presenting his brand, you know, the, the lane in which he was in very controversial. Uh, you know, he turned a lot of heads with his visuals. So, you know, while he was doing that, I always encourage, encourage them to just heavy interaction on Facebook. If people reached out to you and say they love your stuff, you know, say, thank you. You know, uh, we basically turned our, initial hardcore fans into kind of a street team and we did develop a street team um an internet street team in which we had like different um you know different different facebook groups for each city uh, so we really mobilized our fans to to support and get involved and just be a part of the funk volume energy that we were building so we would also do like contests there was there, i came up with the idea of doing a contest it was for artists, but it was mutually beneficial. It was called the Don't Fuck Up Our Beats contest because Hobson, <laughs> Hobson and my brother, they also produce beats. So yes. on, our web, on our website, you can go to the, to the site, download a beat, record a video of yourself rapping to the beat, post it back on YouTube, and we would have this contest. And the contest itself grew because we would do it every year. So we held it probably six or seven times, actually maybe eight times. Uh, so that was a uh, that was a dope way to get other artists involved to 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 promote the brand to promote our beats to promote the projects that we had dropping around that time because we noticed that every time we ran this contest there was just a lot of traffic you know so anything that we were doing that time it was good it was it was good promotion for everybody and it was also a good platform for artists to participate because you know artists coming up they're looking for places to to showcase their talent. Um, and I noticed that every time an artist would submit um, a video through the Don't Fuck Up Our Beats contest, I would go to their YouTube page and 
that would be the most viewed video on their page. So it was working for it. It was working um, as great exposure for them as well. So it was it was just a, a good idea. It's mutually beneficial. Uh, that was one of the things we did. Eventually, I started doing like virtual conferences, like Funk Volume Virtual Conference. I always wanted to do things that helped us solidify us as like a reputable, legit label. Um, and while the artists continue to do their thing too, um, I, I felt that those those things were important from a label branding perspective. Oh man, you roll right into that, man. Because I'm, I was definitely wondering to make Funk Volume, even though it's dissolved now. There's is definitely one of those labels that actually did start to create a name of its own where there's a lot of labels where they just have some artists, but the label isn't known or doesn't have much credibility in itself. So when you say you did conferences, were you talking about like more business type conferences? No, we did a conference just like, so using a platform similar to this, so just at, just imagine, you know, a panel type by where I would have two more people and you would be my, not just asking me questions, but, asking, well, I was the moderator, I would ask, I would set up the panel just like A3C, you know, there would be a schedule, there would be, um, you know, different topics, so it would, it would be held over the course of a day, It'd probably be four or five panels, and people would just tune in just like this, and, and, and listen to the panels and have an opportunity to, to, to ask questions, so I did that a couple times, um, I was just constantly just coming up with ideas, because a lot of artists look to us because you know we were super independent. I mean, we eventually signed a label services deal with Warner, um, mm -hmm. but, but we literally built it fan by fan, and we were just, I just wanted to show artists how we did it, how much effort it took, and how we were thinking about things so that they could benefit from our experience as well. Okay, that, and I'm thinking, were there any hacks though? Would you say there was something that was a hack? I know you said you built fan by fan, but something that really boosted what you guys did? Um, I don't think there's any hacks. You know, you just never know like what video is gonna go crazy. Yeah. Um, but I think it's it's always important, even if you do have a video that goes crazy. Because I think around the time Hop dropped Illmind Four, that was like the first video that kind of went super crazy. Uh, that was one in which he kind of went at Tyler the Creator. Um, so I think that one yeah, really. Yeah, that one that that one really caught a lot of people's attention. But you, I think it's always best to to be prepared for that moment if and when that happens, so that you have a foundation to support it. And you know, some people have one viral video, and then like people look to see w what else they're doing, and there's really nothing there. You know, <laughs> we had we had put out a couple projects. We were super active. So if you if that viral video caught your attention there was already kind of like some momentum brewing to like, oh, this is not just a one-off thing. This is a whole kind of energy. Um, and I think we were able to really um, keep a lot of that attention when, when Hop got it with some of those controversial videos. Yeah, man, you definitely hit the nail on the head. I always tell people, like, you have to have some sort of catalog for people. Once you have their attention, you got to make the most of it because you're not guaranteed to get that attention again. Yeah, yeah. So it's just important to, to build a solid foundation and not just, you know, try to bank on something going viral. Just be prepared for the moment if and when it does happen, for sure. And when you say preparation, I know there's the fact that you guys dropped a lot of music, right? You had a catalog. But in terms of preparation, what other things would you say people would need to be building and getting systematized for preparation when that moment actually does um, come? Well, we were just, we just had a, a team. I mean, our team was, was, was building over time. I mean, we didn't like, we didn't start out with a booking agent. We didn't even really start out with a lawyer, but we added, as we were learning the business, just trying to add the proper components um, to support growth, right? So we eventually got a booking agent. Uh, we eventually hired a, a, a publicist. Uh, we eventually signed more artists. Uh, so we were prepared, we were learning, um, but I feel like we built a pretty solid foundation and it wasn't just kind of like an internet thing. Even though we didn't have a building and an office, like we had, we were pretty well organized. Good. So what did that team look like? Because I know that you were running your team pretty lean 
in the beginning and kind of <laughs> being super efficient, what does that look like when in terms of going from just you? How did you handle it when it was just you all the way to the standpoint of saying this is how I know I need to add this person and another person? For sure. I mean, you know, we weren't really making much money and it were any money. It was really just all my money going out for the first two or three years. So I always tell Cass, you know, Cass, it's important to know like how to manage money and things like that, but you don't need an accountant if there's no money around. So when we started making money, we got a business manager that handled our uh, handled our accounting, helped invoice cats, helped with some of the budgeting and things like that. Um, we always had a lawyer on board for, for different things, whether we were confronted with a sponsorship opportunity or our negotiations with the label, but we definitely ran, we ran it all. We, we operated very lean. Um, and we were lean on purpose because I never put any pressure on the guys to create music, you know, Hobson or my brother, like neither one of them make a lot of music. Um, and when you don't make a lot of music or, or when I don't know what's coming out every year, it's very hard to plan. It's very hard to budget. So, yeah. so it was, it was difficult to bring on people because I didn't really know what we were going to be doing that year. So I didn't want the fixed overhead. That was one of the reasons that we decided to sign to Warner because it was a label services deal and they earned a percentage of our music sales. And we were able to work and kind of cherry pick some of their services. So we would not only get distribution, we would get PR, we would get some marketing support, but that wouldn't be fixed overhead. I wouldn't, you know, that because I didn't know when we would make music, you know, the percentage of sales deal just made a lot of sense because they would get paid when we got paid. Right. So from my standpoint, it kept the artists happy. There was never any pressure to, um, well, the Warner deal didn't make the, art, the artist happy, but that, but for another reason. Um, but from a business standpoint, in terms of how you're structuring the business, it makes a lot of sense because if you go through a year where you don't really make as much money or you don't put out as many projects, and now you got a full time marketing person, now you got a full time publicist, you still got to pay those people, right. and it would it would have been more painful on the business. Got you. That makes sense. So why did you? Um, well, why did the deal? not make the artist happy what happened well they felt that i think it was just like different expectations right you know when you when you say you're working with warner i think you have the expectation of okay they're about to really blow some things up they're about to put us on tv they're about to put us on the radio mm -hmm. um, and that didn't happen right away um and we didn't really make radio music but they did uh, we did go on a radio tour where we at least got the introduction to, to a lot of different radio states. We were definitely planting seeds. So I understood what Warner was doing. You know, we, we did a lot of things. Like they helped our relationship with Sirius Radio. We started getting regular spins on Sirius. That was big for us. And we started developing ra relationships with radio. Um, the relationships with radio, sometimes it doesn't happen overnight. You plant those seeds and, you. you know, eventually they, it, it develops when you have the music. Um, but okay. if you got the music and you got the relationship, then, you know, it can, it can really work. Um, so I saw a lot of the things that they were doing. It just wasn't materializing as, as fast as the guys would have liked. So they didn't understand that they, they interpreted it as them not doing much. I interpreted it as them just planting seeds. Um, and they just, yeah, they was just weren't happy with what Warner was doing. Um, and well, so how do you think, how important do you think that concept of planting seeds is for you and, and just even an, an idea of building those relationships? Because you mentioned serious and I saw that you were just as serious with Sway, mm -hmm. what, like a, a few days ago or last week or something? Yeah, that's another project that we did. I brought nine, nine cats together, flew them to Austin, put them in a house for a week and they, they were tasked with creating an album in a week. We called it one week notice. And we were doing the press for that last week and we stopped this way and, and they dropped some bars off. So that was pretty dope. But that was, that, that was, I don't think that wasn't so, so Warner didn't initiate that relationship, but we did, we did go back to sway during the time um, when we were on Warner 
and every time you see people, it just helps build on that relationship, helps solidify that relationship, helps you get closer to Kat. So, um, you know, every, every time I go to New York, it's always try to make my rounds and just, you know, be face to face with people and, um, you know, just drop off some genuine energy and build. But that makes sense. And I want to think, I'm thinking about a question that somebody had and they were talking about just the artist, right? So this is a business person and they were thinking, how do I cut a deal with an artist today that's good for the artist? What does a good deal for the artist and, um, look like for you? Well, it, it just depends. Every artist is different. It really just depends on where the artist is and what you're contributing to the artist. So I can't even say what a good deal is, right? Because I know labels and, 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 you know, even with the way the hops portrayed me, it's like a lot of times the business side gets a really bad rap mm -hmm. um, for different deals that are proposed. Like, you know, or even just in general, the 360 deal gets a bad rap. Well, some cats that makes sense for them because they're, they weren't anywhere before the label put, you know, a lot of money into what they were doing, you know? Um, so I don't bash 360 deals. I got to really look at each situation in isolation and go, okay, what has the artist done prior to this deal? And then on the other side, what is the label committing to? What is, you know, what resources do they have? How much money are they committing to the situation? Um, how long is the deal for, you know, I probably wouldn't sign a deal of, of any great lengths unless it was, you know, a lot of, you know, unless we're talking about a lot of money. Um, but every situation is different. So that's, what, I'm not trying to, to cop out of the question. It's just a tough, it's a tough one to answer. There's just too many lot of variables. You mentioned not signing for a long time. Why wouldn't you sign for a long time? Um, it's just a lot of, a lot of things can change. Um, the, the industry is constantly changing. The way we consume music is constantly changing. There's different uh, revenue streams that are opening up or that are open today that we didn't have. You know, we did. I didn't know what Patreon was. You know, ten years ago. Yeah. Um, you know, when we first started, we didn't. We weren't monetizing YouTube. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of way. There's and and I don't know what's gonna happen this year. And I don't know what's gonna happen next year. It's just. It would just be tough to, to sign for a lengthy period of time. I know that back in the day, it was normal for cats to sign for like seven, eight albums. Um, to me, that would be kind of crazy yeah. to do at this point. Got you. That makes sense, especially since things are evolving so fast. When you um, talk about the label being built, Funk Volume has, I mean, it had a considerable level of success considering what a lot of people just aren't able to do. What were y'all doing in terms of yearly revenue by the time y'all um, y'all dissolved? Uh, it was definitely a, a. I don't really. I don't typically like to go into it, but it we would. It was definitely a, a, a in terms of revenue, and especially when you throw revenue numbers out there, because there's so much cost involved. Like cats don't understand. Oh my God, there was a multi. Is it was a multi million dollar business, but you know, there's a lot of costs that go into running a label and investing into the future. So, um, you know, I understand how numbers can get misconstrued at times. Bet. That's a perfect um, <laughs> point right there because I know, all right, like you said, millions of dollars, but then you have all these costs. What are those costs that actually, what do they actually look like when you're making and running a full machine like that? Sure. So like I said before, we didn't have an actual building. So we went, we didn't have any, any, any rent or, you know, utilities and stuff like that. You know, most of the stuff that, that we invested in was, was went back into the artists and, and the artist projects. Um, or we did a documentary that, you know, we had to put money into the documentary, um, a publicist costs, lawyers cost, um, our business manager costs, um, what else? What else? To to make our merchandise that costs a lot of money. Um, insurance, tour insurance. When you go on tour, there's a shitload of costs. There's there's <laughs> travel. There's gas. There's you know it's 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 a lot. You know shipping the merchandise out. There, this it's I think a lot of people underestimate all of the different moving parts when you're even if you're just one artist running like a. Because essentially, as a as 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 an artist, you're a small business that has you know five or six different revenue streams. 
they're kind of like five businesses in one when you think about you know the touring the merchandise the music the publishing it's it's a tough thing there's a lot of moving part even if you're just one artist so imagine running a label where you have four different artists and you have all these these things going on for for various artists it can get you know it, it not overwhelming i think we manage it pretty well but you just got to be organized and, and understand kind of you know how to run things got you and well by the time i mean you guys basically had a public spec right things were kind of behind the scenes hobson came out and you know made a song painted your character i'm um, pretty tough right just a, as a there's a uh, there's always miscommunication a lot of times when it comes from business people to artists. That's just a common thing. Right. What do you think that you could do differently in terms of going back and maybe how you build a label to make certain things clearer and how you deal with artists? Or what did you just learn throughout right. your process, just as a career as a whole, not even that particularly? I think it's, it's primarily, it's all, it always comes down to communication um you know communicating more clearly um you know even when you think you're comp you're you're being transparent and being clear that's your perspective you know you learn that some people don't receive it the same way uh, yeah. so you know for for example like one of the things that i broke down to the cats on tour that 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 wasn't understood until i broke it down to them after the fact is when i was doing the budgeting for a tour right we have the revenue that comes in from the show, and then we do meet and greets. So there's mm -hmm. revenue that we get from meet and greet tickets as well. So when I'm do when I was doing the budgeting, I didn't really. Um, I looked at all that revenue as kind of one, and I didn't separate it. So when I was just figuring out what we could pay some of the artists, I would say, okay, we're gonna give you five hundred a night, right? In my mind. That's for the show and the meet and greet. Mm -hmm. I could, I should have said, you know, 300 is for the show, 200 is for the meet and greet. It doesn't change the amount in which you're going to be given. Yeah. It just makes it more clear that you're being compensated for both things. And you can't, cause, cause it was thrown out that somebody wasn't getting paid for the meet and greets. And I had to tell them, that's my bad. I should have told, it wouldn't have changed how much they made, but I would have just made it more clear, you know, but it was clear as day to me because I'm in the Excel spreadsheet. Yeah. I'm the one budgeting. It's just stuff like that. You learn along the way that you just have to communicate better. You know, you always got to communicate better and more clearly because you're not dealing with, I have a different background, right? I come from a corporate environment. Um, I understand Excel. I'm in my PowerPoint and things most artists aren't like that. So I have to learn how to kind of mm -hmm. communicate in a way in which they understand. It's a hard thing to do. Um, so. You, you build a label, you have, you end up making all this money, right? Or, well, per se, you know, however much, but you, as far as successful, successful business, you're making all this money, right? That ends, what does that look like just from a career wise? How do you decide what's next? Because in my, my mind, no, now knowing more about your story, you kind of went through this before, right? You were successful in the financial services industry and then it kind of ended. <laughs> and now you kind of found yourself back in that exact same situation, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I've, I've done enough to always, I've been blessed to have done enough to always have options. Right. Um, you know, it, it was a huge blow, just being honest with you. It was a huge blow to have something that I invested in, not just financially, but that was something that I, I put my life and heart into for, you know, eight plus years. So for it to go away in the most ridiculous fashion, it, it took me a while to kind of get back to this point where I'm where I'm actually feeling good about things. Because um, one of my initial reactions was, you know, I wanted to just run as fast as I can away from music. Like this is like this is some bullshit. Um, you know, so it took me a while and I'm still got kind of going through the process, but I've, I've, I'm doing a number of things. I started the Music Entrepreneur Club. Um, I'm talking with 
a couple companies about going back because as much as I talk about structure with these artists, I feel like I've lost some of mine. I feel like it's always important to have structure. Um, so I might, I might take a job with, with a, with a music company and, and leverage a lot of the things that I've used, or a lot of the things I've learned over the past eight years, in addition to my more strategic strategy stuff that I was doing before and kind of merge those experiences to help out some of these new music companies. Gotcha. Um, so, well, I'm, I'm, I'm still figuring it out, but I've, luckily I'm, I'm back to feeling good and I'm excited about 2018. So I'm, I'm looking forward to getting, getting, getting my hands dirty this year. Hey, so we talked about music entrepreneurs club. Describe what that is. How did you come up with that idea in the first place? Well, like I said before, we, we had done some virtual conferences. So I've always had like a toe in education and I just know how important it is just being through the ridiculous situations that I continue to find myself in with artists. Cause I just feel like if, if artists come to the table with a certain level of understanding of the business, it will really minimize a lot of the tension with the behind the scenes or the business people. Um, you know, even some of the things that I see get blown out of proportion online is like people don't even understand the business. They, they, their, their heart is with the artist because, you know, the artist has the connection with the fan. So whatever the artist says, the fans are going to rock with it. But I always look at the different situations people in are online and I'm just like, you know, people have no idea. <laughs> what that situation could have you don't know what their deal looked like you don't know nothing you're just taking the artist side and run with it. and i get it but the music entrepreneur club is i think is important it's a place where you can come network with other artists other producers other managers i'm in the process of also merging the club with kato's beat club so kato is a producer who i've worked with a lot um in the past he has his own beat club is primarily for producers and we've recently agreed to merge the two groups and just make it a bigger community, a more supportive community. Cause there's also tension between like rappers and producers, you know, yeah. producers, <laughs> producers, producers always posting these memes about not getting paid. Um, <laughs> so I, we're just hoping to bring it all together. Yeah. And you know, there is some shady stuff that happens in the music industry, but I feel like more often than not, it's just misunderstanding mm. um, and, and, and just a lack of knowledge. So, you know, I want to break that all down so that if you do get in a shitty, shady situation, you know what you're dealing with. Um, at the end of the day, you don't got to sign nothing. Like nobody's forcing you to do anything. So if you want to navigate the industry with utmost confidence, all you got to do is equip yourself with some knowledge and you'll be straight. Hmm. Okay. Nope. So, I mean, that's that virtual reality. I mean, the virtual conference set up people log in, do they have to pay anything monthly? Yeah, so right now it's only $10 a month. And mm -hmm. right now we're meeting twice a week, but we're changing the structure where we're just going to do one one session a week. Okay. And I'm constantly bringing in guests, so it's not just me. I bring in, I, I, I tap my network and I bring in, I've had last, last year I've had Tuma from Spotify come in, I have people from Empire come in, I got people from Warner coming in. Like these are legit established professionals and i don't think this experience is being offered anywhere else online and it's only ten dollars a month mm -hmm. um so you, you can't this ain't a money grab for me but I, I feel like it is important to separate people even if you're paying 10 that lets me know you're a little bit serious you're not gonna yep. just come in and start fucking around um, <laughs> so you know it's ten dollars a month um the, the merge should be done we're trying to figure it out, but it should be started in February where we're also going to incorporate like some, some music critique sessions throughout the month. Um, and I think it just build, build a solid community. Ultimately I want the, 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 the biggest value to be from just being part of the community. So if we grow the community to a point where you're traveling in New York and you can just post in the group and be like, man, I'm looking for a videographer in New York or, producer in new york everybody could just be supportive and collaborative and just you know make some dope music without all the shenanigans yeah <laughs> okay dope man and i know you guys have been running that um just to let you guys know i've been i sat in in some sessions and they're definitely dope but the, the main last session i sat in was the bitcoin session um mm -hmm. that was an interesting um, perspective of how 
the, that technology, the blockchain technology will be affecting music. So you get all different types of um, views at the industry from a business side and obviously from more of that artist producer side. It looks like you're about to go very heavy on the producer side because you're adding the beat community and the merger. So yeah. it's definitely worth it just from continuous knowledge from more people who are knowledgeable about the industry. Yeah. Um, but, I, think it's, I think it's real dope that you're doing that, man. No, oh, thank you. Thank you. I got to have you on at some point. You got to join in, in as a guest. I got to get you on here. Yeah, man. Hey, I, I'd be glad to. Got to make that happen eventually. Mm -hmm. um, before we get out of here, I uh, want to ask you a few questions just from some subscribers, make sure I get those in. Okay. And, uh, so I'll do at least three. So one, how can you keep a modern customer interested with you enough to build a core fan base? So what's your perspective? I think I heard that answer a little bit already. Um, you know, you got you, you got to have a unique story, a unique brand. Um, you know, I, there's a lot of artists out there. You got to figure out, you know, how to stand out from the pack. Um, and, and I always believe that you got to, make quality music i know that there's music that comes out that that kind of comes out and then it you know it, then it dissolves there's a lot of one hit wonders still there's people that were hot last year that are nowhere to be found i think if you want to you have to have the unique story and i think you have to have great music but you also have to be good enough at music to understand how to continuously reinvent yourself over time um that, that's a challenge that i don't think a lot of artists are prepared for because uh, your fan base is going to mature, your fan base is going to grow, and it's going to be hard to keep them engaged with the same type of music. Um, and I think that's the challenge that Hobson's going to have. You know, a lot of his fans were, were young when they first caught on to him. So that's like 14, 15. You know, flat, fast, fast forward seven years later, some of these casts are 22, 23. That's a huge change. Um, so you have to just just be able to have your unique story, unique messaging, and your content that supports and, and communicates that, but also be good enough at music and have the mindset of just being able to grow as a man or a woman and continuously reinvent yourself as an artist to keep yourself interesting over time. It's a super tough task, and only like the, the best of the best, I believe, are able to do it, like your Kanye's. Um, you know, I think obviously Jay and I mean, the cast that have been around for a minute, I, I think, you know, have the team around and, and, and are smart enough and talented enough to do it. Got you. I think that was a great answer, man. Um, how would you say, well, what's your opinion? Um, this is another question from a, a fan. Uh, what's your opinion on building multi-genre record labels? Is it easier to build one genre or start off building multiple genres? Um, multiple genres. Well, the way, so it wasn't, I, I eventually wanted to get into under other genres of music, but I felt it was important, especially because within hip hop, there's so many subgenres of hip hop. Um, one of the things that made funk volume successful was just the cross promotion and the support of the, of the, all of the guys, right? So even if somebody had finished their album cycle, maybe Jaron Benton just started his and, but, but Hobson and J and Dizzy were still on his record, so they still there was still a reason to share what they were doing. There was just always something going on. Yeah. Um, I know that that has nothing to do with like different genres, but so I, so this is a separate point in terms of building a label. I feel like it's 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 great when you guys are really taking advantage of the cross promotion and, and just doing a lot of stuff to keep the energy going. Um, in terms of different genres, I don't think it's a I think it's probably easier now because I feel like there's a, a like a lot of shared fan bases. I think that a lot of Bryce and Tiller fans are also hip hop fans, mm -hmm. um, you know, or, or SZA fans are also. There's like a lot of mixture of the genre, or like Ty Dolla Sign is kind of in the he's kind of hip hop, but he's R and B cat. Right, um, right, right. As long as you're not all over the place, you know, I wouldn't have like a country cat. And then like a, you know, a, a gangster rap cat, like there, that would be confusing. And there's probably not as much of a benefit from the cross promotion. Those are probably like, that's one fan base and that's another. And your identity as a label is confusing as shit. 
Um, you know, as I was building Funk Volume, and as we were to continue to build, every time we added another artist, I wanted I wanted them to be way different than who we already had, so that we tapped a different demographic, but still within hip hop. You know, but there's just so much variety in hip hop alone. You know that that I think that's a that's a that's a smart strategy. At the end, once we had ten artists, I wanted to be able to kind of satisfy everybody's hip hop needs. So that if you told me you were a hip hop fan, there was somebody on the roster that you were rocking with. That was like the vi- that was like the long term vision. If we were able to keep going okay. and have like ten cats on on the label, like see, even if you, I don't know if we would ever just have like a like straight mumble rapper. Like that wasn't like all of our cats could spit, yeah. even though they would like even though they were different. But we would definitely pick up somebody that would that was more melody driven. Gotcha. You know? But still able to hold their own in a cipher. That would probably be like the yeah. The, yeah. That that'd probably be like the common denominator. Yeah, because I can't see those guys <laughs> respecting yeah. the mumble rapper in their particular group. Yeah, yeah. So that yeah, I, then we we were actually gonna sign a cat named On Q, a white dude. Um, mm-hmm. if you listen, and he's he's definitely drift. He's still a rapper, but he's definitely drifted more towards, especially recently. Uh, like singing and, and more melodic stuff, and I felt like that would like he would have been a dope addition to the team because he respects hip hop. He's he's definitely in the lineage of of hip hop, and and you know he he even works with Just Blaze and stuff like that. So it was true to being a hip hop cat, but his his music is definitely more melodic, and he even sings sometimes. So I thought that would be kind of a good pickup for us. No, so I guess the the answer to summarize just multi-genre labels versus, you know, uh, just one genre. It's really, when you're starting off, there's a lot of benefit in that ability to cross promote because you can't build if you're going in a lot of different directions. So even though we're kind of melting down these ideas of certain genres because of the way these are distributed these days, you still want to think about maybe not necessarily the genre, but still the cons- end consumer. Skip over the genre, but think about the end consumer. So the people who will be interested in it make sure there's crossover, not between necessarily the genre, but the people who are interested in the artists, right? Yeah, well, yeah, because just like the, the artist has a story and a brand and a message, like we still have a brand and a message as a label, right. um, you know, even though it houses multiple artists, you know, for what Funk Volume represented, you know, it's still whatever artists we did bring, it still have to be in line with what the overarching theme of, of, of the label was. and. You know, it was really true, true artistry, um, being true to yourself. Those are it, they're broader themes because it needs to encompass all of the artists. But we still have an identity as a label as well, a brand as a label. So you can't forget that if you're the one kind of building the label, building the brand. Right. right. So I'm going to kind of inject my opinion with a question and ask a question, too, because that made me think of the fact that if you're building a label, especially from indie on up, these days, the way it's guerrilla style, and you really want to b- um, build those communities around it, the label is going to have to be a lot more in the front um, as opposed to, let's just say, Interscope, right? Back in the day where, I mean, the artists were from Tupac to, I can't even think of some of the Gwen Stefani, all these different things, but they're really just a corporation funding it. The fans really have no investment in the label. But today, since you're building a community around not just the artists, but also trying to capture around the label so you can use that leverage to build, you know, and yeah. get more, more artists, you need to make sure that even the label itself speaks to the fan, right? For sure, for sure. That's one of the advantages I think independent labels have over majors. I mean, you, you don't really see fans wanting a Sony shirt or an <laughs> shirt, like, yeah. But we actually have a connection with the fan. We created a community, um, and, and that's definitely whereas the majors have more money than us, uh, and probably more relationships and stuff like that. We actually have a connection with the fans, and it's real. Um, and that's actually one of the a powerful advantage um, of independence over over a major record label for sure. Take advantage of that. So, a last question from a subscriber and. I'm going to get you out of here. What are you looking for when you're searching for a new talent for a label? Um, 
well, I'm no longer, I, <laughs> I'm kind of tapped out like working with artists at the moment. Like I'm going to be working on one-off projects and things like that. But when I was running the label, um, obviously talent um, got to be just, just great at making songs, not just rapping. Um, so you got got to be good at making songs. Um, you you got to have a, a good live show. Yeah. Um, touring is a big part of, of the business model when you're an independent or when you're any artist, really. Um, you know, you want to be able to put on a good show. You got to be comfortable on, on camera. The visuals, like I said before, is super crucial to, you know, your marketing campaign. Um, a strong work ethic, um, you know, takes feedback well, easy to get along with. It took us a while to sign. Like when we signed Jaren and Dizzy, it took us some time to really kind of get to know them before you, you pull the trigger. You know, back in the day, label signed a shitload of artists, and they're not doing that as much these days where you're not because because they're, they're trying to get a return on the investment. But as an independent label, like we can't sign cast that we don't plan on really working with and really trying to grow because you know, we can't just throw money away signing people here and there you know, unless we're really serious. So um, it, it takes a, a while to, 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 to learn the person, get an idea where their head's at. You watch how they move too, because if they're not moving at all by themselves, then they probably won't move with us, right? Because we're essentially doing the same thing just on a few steroids, right? You still got you still got to move like an independent artist, even if you team up with an independent um, machine or an independent label that has some momentum going. So I look for that too. Like if an artist doesn't have that mindset and they're not moving on their own, then I, I don't, I don't feel like they understand what it takes to continue growth even within funk volume. So that's crucial. Man, that's big. Mm -hmm. All right. And if you drop it on them, you, you mentioned it a little bit, but uh, tell them a little bit more about that, not, um, that one week notice project. I want to make sure they check that out while, while we have their attention. Yeah, the one week notice project again. I flew nine cats. There was um, seven artists, two producers, but two of the artists were also producers. So we had Dizzy Wright, Jaren Benton, Audio Push, Demrick, Emilio Rojas, Reezy, Kato, DJ Hopper. Um, threw them in a house in Austin. We stayed in the house for a week. They really did make the project in a week, less than a week, actually. It was probably like over the course of five days. They made about 20 tracks. Um, and then this was in December. And then we, we got it mixed and mastered over the next couple couple weeks, and we dropped it on January 5th. It's a really dope project. I always like, well, I've always wanted to try this experiment because I just think it's dope when cats get together and let their creativity clash and, and, you know, sometimes you might get some shit that's just terrible. Um, but sometimes you get some great stuff and I feel like the music that they made, um, was awesome. You know, it doesn't sound like just, it's not just like cypher songs with cats throwing verses here and there. There's, there's concepts. It's actually a, a, a pretty cohesive project, oh. um, especially being put together in such a short amount of time. So check it out. It's everywhere. It's on Spotify. It's on iTunes. It's, you know, all your digital distribution platforms. Um, and if you like cast their rap, most of them are, or all of them are pretty much spitters. I think, they all spit. <laughs> yeah, I, think, I think people would appreciate the project. It's dope. Um, so I look forward to doing a, a similar project with other artists this year. Like I think that'll be a, a way in which I continue to work with artists. Just bring different artists together have them create something in a short amount of time and, you know, capture the process and try to make that bigger, put that on a bigger platform every time. I think that'll be a dope project to be a part of. All right. I hope that interview was as helpful for you as it was for me. Definitely check Damien out on social media at dame.stillmoving. Ask him some questions. I'm sure he'll be open to answer. Check out Music Entrepreneurship Club. It's a great source because, hey, I sat on on a few um, of his sessions listening to things like Bitcoin and blockchain and music and a lot of different random things that could be worth you checking out as well. He's a credible source and I think you should have as many sources as possible that are actually willing to give real good information out there. Would love to know what you guys think in the description below. Let me know. Other than that, if you like this video, hit that like button. If you like it, might as well share it. And if you're not subscribed, 
You know what to do. Hit that subscribe button.